So that when you know people because I realize that people that are watching my video or at least contract law they are from different you know um, departments some are from finance accounting and the rest and you know they hinted me the last time that I should make it as simplistic as possible there are so many things I say that are law related that they might not necessarily understand so I'm going to break every case down and every fact down and anything that seems to be complicated i'm going to try to explain it as much now, as i can um first question what is an offer now an offer is a promise or undertaking which is made by a person to another that when that promise or undertaking is accepted by that other person there is an intention that it will become binding now let me try to break it down the first thing under an offer is an undertaking or a promise an undertaking or a promise and this undertaking must be made to another person this undertaking must be made to another person and there must be an intention for there to be a contract Three things that must be in your definition of an offer. There must be an undertaking or a promise made by one person to another with the intention that when the other party accepts the terms of the offer, then there should be a contract. So the next question we are going to have, what will come or what we say is a promise or undertaking? A promise or undertaking must be precise must be clear and unequivocal the promise or undertaking must be precise must be clear and must be unequivocal and this was stated by Nikki Toby in the case of Orange Bank versus Bilante Limited you have to make sure that your terms of offer your promise your promise or undertaking is precise, is clear, and it re leaves no room for conjecture. It leaves no room for speculation. So you make sure that everything is clear in the offer that you are bringing. While I am looking at the case laws, I will try my possible best to make sure that I identify, you know, the terms of the offer in each of those cases so that you can understand what I said by this. The next question that we are supposed to ask is, when you say that an offer can be made to another person, can an offer be made to more than one person at a time? You know, that is the next question. The first question that we ask, what is an offer? We already answered that. Next question, what will we say is an undertaking or a promise? And I'm saying that an undertaking or a promise are the terms of a contract which must be clear and must be unequivocal and must be precise and must leave no room for speculation or conjecture. The next question, can an offer be made to more than one person? And that was what was decided in the Locust Classicals case of Khalil versus Kabolic Smokeball Company. So when I say Locust Classicals cases, I mean a case that established a principle, which means you cannot talk about a principle without mentioning the case. Don't forget that last time in our previous video, I said that contract is a common law based 
thing. So when you're talking about contract law, you don't find it in any statute saying that it's section this and offer can be defined as this. No, you find it in case laws. So all the rules that involve and the principles that we have, you are going to find them in cases. That is why we call them common law because Kalim versus Kabolik is an 18 something case, 19 something case, you know, and most of contract law cases are 18 something cases and all that, except those that we are uh, that were litigated in Nigeria. And so you don't need to quote the English case since you already have a Nigerian version of it. For example, when I said an offer needs to be precise, unequivocal, and clear, and all that, that was stated by Nikitobi in Oriente Bank versus Bilante. So that, that's, you would also have the English version of it, but you don't need to quote the English version of it since there's a Nigerian version of it but if you can remember the English version of it where it was decided then while you are quoting the Nigerian version of it make sure you also quote the English version of it so now let us go back to what we're talking about which is an offer can be made to more than one person now that was stated in the case of Khalil versus Kabolik so let us look at the fact of Khalil versus Kabolik in the case of Khalil versus Kabolik Smokeball Company, the Kabolik Smokeball Company made a product called the Smokeball and claimed it to be a cure for influenza and a number of other diseases. The company published advertisements in the Paul Mall Gazette and other newspapers on the 13th of November 1891, claiming that it would pay £100 to anyone who got sick with influenza after using its product according to the instructions provided with it. Mrs. Louisa Elizabeth Khalil saw the advertisement, bought one of the balls and used it three times daily for nearly two months until she contracted the flu on the 17th of January 1892. She claimed £100 from the Kabolik Smokeball Company and they ignored two letters from her husband, a solicitor. On the third request for a reward, they replied with an anonymous letter that if it is used properly, the company had complete confidence in the smoke ball's efficacy, but to protect themselves against all fraudulent claims, they would need her to come to their office to use the ball each day and be checked by the secretary. Mrs. Khalil brought an action to court. The barristers representing her argued that the advertisement and a reliance on it was a contract between the company and her, so the company ought to pay. The company argued that it wasn't a serious contact. In fact, the company argued that the contract was impossible because the company cannot make a contract with the whole world. Now that we have seen the fact of Khalil versus Kabolik Smokeball Company, I'm just going to ex try to explain it for those that are non-law students. So, just the same way we have COVID-19 right now, that is coronavirus 2019, there was a time in the world where they had a, a pandemic known as influenza. Do you understand? So, the same way we have COVID-19, there was a time we had a pandemic known as influenza and people were not allowed to go out, were not allowed to do a lot of stuff, just like we're not allowed to do a lot of stuff right now, which is a very good blessing to me as, you know, if you're a student, it's a very good blessing to you, except those very serious students, those people that carry book on their head. Well, sorry about that. Now, moving on. Talking about the pandemic and talking about the fact that there, there was a lockdown. Now, the smoke ball uh, company made a smoke ball and said if you take this smoke ball then you would not you know contact influenza just like saying that oh right now we advise to use sanitizers and face masks i would have worn my face mask but it's going to be so stupid of me to wear a face mask inside the video it doesn't make any sense but then if i were i was wearing this, a face mask and then i had sanitizers imagine a company saying that when you put on a face mask and when you rub sanitizers your hand especially their product you are not going to get a uh, um, coronavirus that's exactly how it was so according to that time if you take this smoke ball you are not going to get influenza according to them if you should get influenza then we are going to pay you hundred dollars that is what they said in their adverts they are going to pay, pay you hundred dollars now coming back 
to this so imagine that they say um if you get coronavirus after using our sanitizers and after using our face masks we are going to pay you 10 million naira i mean that's going to be a very good deal so um khalil on this hand decided to buy the smoke ball and smoked the ball and then still contacted influenza and then went to court and because he demanded the money which was declined and then went to court that is supposed to have the money now one issue that was raised in courts which the both parties had to address which i mean the lawyers to the both parties had to address is whether or not an offer can be made to the whole world now when the counsel for the defend for the defendant which is khalil sorry which is a uh, the smoke ball company when the council was arguing the council said that you cannot have a contract with the whole world okay so the court rejected that particular argument and said this is not a contract with the whole world this is an offer to the whole world there are two different things when you're having a contract with the whole world you are saying that there is offer there is acceptance and every other thing that will make a binding contract here you can have a an offer to the whole world and anybody who meets the term of the offer and therefore accepts the offer will have a binding contract in the circumstance so the case of Khalil versus Kabbalik basically establishes the principle that an offer can be made to the whole world so if you have if you have a, 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 an offer made to the whole world it is a valid offer now the next a question that is to be asked is it all advertisements that becomes an offer because that particular um uh, thing where they said we have influence and all that that was an advertisement so that people would buy the smoke ball do you understand so that because if you hear on the news now or anywhere that if you buy this particular sanitizer or you buy this particular um uh, face mask you are not going to contact coronavirus a lot lot of people are going to buy it because nobody wants to contact coronavirus people have died from coronavirus the question now becomes would an advertisement of such nature amount to uh, 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 an offer? Every advertisement, would they be an offer? Th that's the question that we're going to ask. And I'm going to answer that question when we are under the topic of invitation to treat. So right now, we've looked at what would, talk, what would be a promise or undertaking. We looked at whether or not a contract can be made to the whole world or more than one person. Now, when we are talking about intention to have a contract, we will talk about this when we are talking about intention to enter legal relation, which is the fourth element of a contract. The first is offer, second is acceptance, third, third is consideration, while fourth is intention to enter legal relation. So while the person was making, a, making an offer, the person must have had the intention to you know make a binding contract so i'm going to discuss this on that intention to enter legal relation. the next question that we need to ask is are all offers meant to be expressed or some can be implied so what i'm saying is if i am going to make an offer must i make it point blank if it's going to be a written document there are some contracts that are written some are parole which is oral you know contract now when we are having a written contract or an oral contract is it possible that i must state this is an offer that i am making to you like must it be written in black and white this is an offer so that when the court is going to judge the court will know oh this is an offer that's been made are all offers meant to be expressly made or there are some offers that could be implied now a, a typical example is when you want to you know go from a place to the other definitely you have to enter transportation so i am not talking about the normal legal state transportation yaba transportation where they yaba 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 or mushi transportation i'm talking about a more civilized transportation just imagine that the whole of nigeria is banana island and we i'm not i don't even do they do they have buses in banana island where everybody just drives that chiwa going up and down i don't know but i've never been to banana island before if you've been to banana island before then you can like write it in the comment section so i would know but just imagine everywhere that's civilized as banana island and we are talking about transportation you know they wouldn't be yaba 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 or and they go here and they go here people will just basically line up and then there's a bus then you see the inscription like where the bus is going to you enter into the bus and then the bus drives you off now the question is there where the bus moves and all that that is a contract a contract of service to take you from one place to the other but did you expressly have to say i want to go to you don't need to because it is already written on the bus that oh we are going to this place and then you just enter into the bus now those kind of contracts 
or those kind of offers and acceptance, they are not expressly stated that I want to make an offer or I want to accept your offer. But by implications, impliedly, you can see that there is an offer, even though it hasn't been stated expressly, and there is acceptance when the boss moves, even though it has not been stated expressly. So not all offers and not all acceptance is supposed to be oral. It's supposed to be oral. That means I want to make an offer. Some can be through your actions. Do you understand? So now i'm going to give two cases on that particular principle the fact that offer need not be expressly so the first case i'm going to be uh, uh, making is going to uh, be major only versus communication associates major only versus communication associates so right now let us look at the facts of major only versus communication associates in the case of major only versus communication associates the plaintiff made an offer to let his flats to the defendants. The latter modified the terms of the offer by including the installation of air conditioners. The plaintiff immediately installed the air conditioners. The court held that this brought a contract into existence between the two parties. Although it was not explicitly stated in the judgment, it is clear that by installing the air conditioners, the plaintiff had accepted the defendant's counter offer by conduct. The court did not consider the subjective intentions of the parties, but what a reasonable person would infer from the conduct of the parties. So now that we have looked at the fact of major only versus communication associates, we are going to see that, you know, I, let, me, let me paint this as an example so that people who do not understand how fact and judgment work would be able to relate. Now imagine that there is a house now and A wants to buy the house. Let's say A wants to buy or rent the house and then the house is owned by B. The house is owned by B, and B wants to, uh, let's say, sell the house to A, or rent the house to A, let's say rent, rent is better, because according to the fact, it's more of rent than buy. So let's say, rent the house to A, and A now uh, uh, enters the house, he goes to the house, he looks at the house, you know, you cannot buy a thing without looking at it, except your draft or something. So he looked at the house and said, Oh, it's a very beautiful house. I like the furniture. I like the this, but I cannot buy a house without AC inside. Do you understand? And then he left. And then B looked at the fact that he said he cannot buy a house without AC inside and went to. He didn't expressly tell him, "Hey, I want to um, go and make uh, buy ACs into the house or something like that." So he, he when he left, he went to buy the ACs, installed it into the house, and then. Called him up to tell him, hey, Alpha, I don't waste you, and stuff like that. So, and then A and I said, no, sorry about that. I, I think I found something better or something. And then B had to go to court to litigate the fact that, you know, there was a contract. And he saying that he's no longer interested would be a breach of contract. That is, the, the, the people getting the house in the circumstance was communication associate. Major only was the owner of the house. And communication associate wanted to rent the house. And then the court said that... When B wanted to give the house to A initially, that means when Major Oni wanted to give the house to A, he made an offer, and that offer was expressed, come and rent the house for this social so amount. Now, instead of the offer to be accepted by A, which is communication associates, communication associates instead said I wanted AC, thereby modifying the terms of the offer to include AC, making it a counter offer. It cannot be an acceptance here because they, they, when you are accepting, you are accepting all the terms of the offer. The offer was clear, was precise and wasn't equivocal. Do you understand? So when A uh, um, countered the offer here, he countered his offer making another offer entirely. He countered the offer making another offer which includes AC. B accepted the, uh, uh, the, the offer by, he didn't accept it orally, but he accepted it by his conduct by going to, you know, get ACs into the property, which means that you don't necessarily need to say, I want to accept your offer or something. But when you impliedly, before the offer is revoked, so here the offer had not been revoked when B went to, you know, um, make 
uh, adjustment and uh, um, install ACs into the house. So you need to understand that offer and acceptance could be either impliedly or be expressed. The first thing you need to know, offer needs to be precise, needs to be clear, needs to be unequivocal, needs to be without speculation. You have to know that, you know, offer can be made to more than one person. In fact, it can be made to the whole world. You have to know that an offer can be made expressly or impliedly. And that is where I started with the case of Major Winnie versus Communication Associates. And now I am going to the next case of Brogen versus Metropolitan Railway. Brogen versus Metropolitan Railway. In the case of Brogen versus Metropolitan Railway Company, the plaintiff made an offer to the defendants in writing, requesting the latter to sign and return a form containing the terms of the offer. The defendants never did this, but nevertheless, they carried out the contract on these terms. It was held that they were bound by the contract. They had accepted the offer by their conduct. So according to the case of Brogen versus Metropolitan Railway, which we have you know, listened to, now someone made an offer to the other party and said that the other party should return a letter back. You know, that means you should make it expressly. This case explains to us that you don't need to make your acceptance express. Do you understand? Neither do you need to make your offer express. But that wasn't stated in the case, however. You don't need to make your acceptance express. So, uh, someone said, uh, someone sent a letter to B, and then let me let me try to make this illustration here. A sent a letter to B, and then A told B that B should send the letter back if B was going to accept. B instead of sending a letter back, decided to just you know do the what the contract says. So let's say A was telling B that B should supply 50 bags of rice for 50 million. Just giving an example. Supply 50 bags of rice for 50 million. If you are going to accept this, send me a letter first so that I will know and all that. B, instead of sending a letter, decided to supply 50 bags of rice. And now he's asking A for his 50 million and then went to court. And that was like what the court held and said. The, irrespective of the fact that B was supposed to send a letter, as far as B has accepted the offer impliedly by, by sending the bags, that is a valid and a binding contract. So this is the point where we are going to go to um, invitation to treat. We've looked at offer. Now let us look at invitation to treat. So guys, this is invitation to treat. And basically, I'm going to be giving a lot of examples on that invitation to treat. A lot of examples. But I want you to have one thing at the back of your mind. Everything that is made or done before an offer is made is an invitation to treat. Every single thing is an invitation to treat. So, um, when I told you about offer, I said offer is an undertaking or a promise made by one party to the other with an intention that it will become a contract when it is accepted by the other party. And I told you that an undertaking or a promise is something that is clear, precise, unequivocal, and leave no room for conjecture. Before anything, before a contract, sorry, before an offer in itself is made, before something that is precise, that is clear, that is unequivocal is made, anything before that is invitation to treat. You need to understand that everything before that is invitation to treat. I can remember when I was in year two, Professor Abiola Sonny during my class, he was the one that taught us offer and invitation to treat, the beginning of it. You know, Professor Agomo taught us the history and the beginning of contract. Professor Abiola Sonny taught us the um, offer and, and uh, invitation to treat. And then he told us that when you see footballers on a pitch about to start a match, the beginning, you know, is when they juggle ball up and down, do a little bit of this and that, and all ups and downs and all that. Bef that is done before the, the, the assemble into formations and then before the referee blows the whistle, whistle for a real match. Now, you see where the referee blows the whistle for a, for a real match? That is where there is offer, where one party kicks the ball and then the other party starts. Now there is a contract. Do you understand? You see, every single thing done before the referee blows his whistle is invitation to treat. Do you understand that? So picture that when we are talking about invitation to treat and offer, every single thing 
done before something clear, precise, unequivocal is done, then it is a, uh, an invitation, invitation to treat and not a contract. Sorry, not an offer. Do you understand? So, the first thing I'm talking about right now is auction. A for auction. The first thing I'm talking about right now is auction. So, if you are in year two, you will likely not know what auction is, but I'm going to give an example. Now, um, you want to sell. How many of you have been to Nikkei Art Gallery? That's one very exotic place. I hope I go there. My first time it was exotic. So in case if you want to take me out, you can see there's no ring. So you can like. Okay, so now imagine that you go to Nikkei Art Gallery. You can see the pictures behind me exactly. That's how they are, but more beautiful at Nikkei Art Gallery. Now imagine that Nikkei calls for an auction. And says, Oh, I want to sell this picture, and it is a very beautiful piece. And then they want to like um give it out. Now, an auction is where there are a lot of people. You know when they say, I'll buy it for twenty thousand, I'll buy it for thirty thousand, I'll buy it for fifty thousand, you know that kind of thing. That's exactly what an auction is. So, and then when there is something like that, most times it should commonsensically speaking, when you are doing an auction, you usually sell it to the highest bidder. I mean that's the that's the essence of an auction. So like that, I'll buy it, I'll buy it, I'll buy it until really like five hundred thousand, and then it stops at five hundred thousand because nobody wants to buy it more than that. And then Nikkei says, "Oh, I'm going to sell it to you at five hundred thousand. That's what an auction is. So when you auction a thing, you sell it to the highest bidder. Do you understand? So now in this case, the question is, where is the offer? Where is the acceptance? And where is the invitation to treat in an auction? Is it Nikkei that is making the offer by bringing the picture, like saying, I want to sell this picture, blah, 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 and all that, all those things. Is she the one that is making the offer? And then anybody who says, I want to buy it, I want to buy it, is making the acceptance. Or is it um, the people saying, I want to buy it, I want to buy it, I want to buy it, that is making the offer, and Nikkei is accepting? That is the question that we are going to ask here. And the answer is, yes, those people that are saying, I want to buy, I want to buy for this particular amount, are the ones actually making the offer. And you see Nikkei, she is the one that is going to um, accept the offer by bringing down the armor. In law, when you say you bring down the armor during an auction, it means that you accepted to the highest bidder in the auction. Do you understand? So basically, you are going to accept to anybody who bids the highest. That was the principle stated in the case of pain versus give. That you know, where there is an auction, the person or the people that is making the, the, the offer would be those that want to, you know, buy it. And then the person making the acceptance would be, for example, Nikke, who is saying, Oh, okay, yes, you can buy it for five hundred thousand. Do you understand? And that's this principle has been, you know entrenched into our laws, into section, not even our laws, but section 58, subsection 2 of the civil code. I told you that some aspects of contracts are codified, but then, this is not in total an aspect of contract, it is more of commercial transaction than contract, but the only part that becomes contract is where there is an offer, where there is, an, where there is acceptance, do you understand? So section 58 of section 2 of sales of goods act of 1884 says that you know where the, the, the parties making the offers are those ones why person making the acceptance is this one that's the person who actually owns the things to be sold and then you can also find an equivalent know that this thing is applicable to the eastern part of nigeria and the northern part of nigeria we know the reason is applicable to the northern part of but then, for the western part of Nigeria, that is Lagos, Undo, Oyo, Ogun, Edo, Delta, and the rest, they use the sales of goods law, which also have the same, you know, um, sections in it. So we are on the same page to say that, you know, to, to have the principle and all that. So under this auction. This, the first rule, we already know what the first rule in pain and cave is. Now, the second rule is that an advertisement for an auction is not an offer for the auction. Do you understand? An advertisement that an auction will hold is not an offer in court that will be accepted when the person comes. And so when the person does not, the initial, okay, let me try to explain this. An advertisement saying, A advertises, I am going to have an auction on the 27th. Now, B came for the auction on that same 27th. Now, the question to ask is if A fails to show up, would it be a breach of contract? Uh, Chill, I need to get some right.
Yes. Oh God, don't worry. So if A fails to show, does it mean that A has breached a contract because B came to the auction? A failed to show up and A advertised that it was going to be there on the 27th. So why if A fails to show up, then there should be a breach of contract. It was held in the case of Harris and Nicholson. Harris v. Nicholson, that the fact that A failed to show up for an auction does not amount to a breach of contract and there was no offer and there was no acceptance. The third and final principle that we need to learn on the auction is that where there has been a reserved price, there are some times that some, some um, auctioneers would say, you know, I want to sell, for example, look at this picture behind me now, I want to sell one of those pictures for nothing less than 50 million. Do you understand? Or Nikkei says, I want to sell one of these pictures for nothing less than 50 million. And then, when the auction is going on, so far the purchaser would have or already have notice of the fact that I am selling that in no less than 50 million. Even if I drop the hammer for something less than 50 million, it is not going to, it is not going to um, count as, you know, a contract because the purchaser has notice. But when the purchaser has no notice, and in the mind of the auctioneer, there is a reserved price for that particular uh, property in quotes. Then, if it drops below, if it drops the amount below that particular purchase price, there is still a contract. And that was held in the case of Adibaje versus Kunde. Adibaje versus Kunde. So let us go to the fact of Adibaje versus Kunde. In the case of Adibaje versus Kunde. The plaintiff was the highest bidder for the sale of land auctioned on behalf of the defendants. The defendants refused to recognize the plaintiff as purchaser and the plaintiff brought a suit against them for an order of specific performance. The defendant contended that they had instructed the auctioneer to put a reserve price on the land and that the purchaser's bid was below the reserve price. The fact revealed not only that the auctioneer failed to state the reserve price, but that the defender never gave him such instruction. The court held, affirming the validity of the sale to the plaintiff, that even where a reserve price has been fixed by the vendor, as long as the purchaser has no notice of this, and since the auctioneer has implied authority to sell without reserve, then a sale below the reserve price in such a circumstance is binding on the vendor, and the latter cannot against the buyer enforce a limitation of the auctioneer's ostensible authority not made known to the buyer. Now, according to the facts that we've read in the case of Adivaji versus Kondi, we are going to see that we have the plaintiff and then we have the defendant. And then the plaintiff here was the one who bought the property. And then, let's, let's give an example, there was no price stated. So, let's give an example, they wanted to buy a piece of land. This is the land here, and they wanted to buy the piece of land. The the plaintiff bought the piece of land rather for ten million naira. Now, according to the fact, you would see that the auctioneer who auctioned the property did not wasn't the defendant. Do you understand? So let us say the defendant had an agent who was the auctioneer, and then according to the defendant, there had already been a reserved price. Let us say our reserved price is fifty million naira. Now the defendant told the auctioneer, according to the fact, at least according to what the defendant was relying on, he told the auctioneer that he should sell the property for no less than 50 million. Now, the auctioneer sold the property to the plaintiff here for 10 million naira, which is definitely below the um, reserve price. And then the plaintiff sued the defendant. No, we have to talk about this. You cannot cheat me. And then the court held, in that case, that the court held two things that are very, very important. First of all, the only time a reserve price is going to be enforced by the court if sales is done below it is when the the, 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 the purchaser here, which is the plaintiff, has notice of the reserve price. When the purchaser doesn't have notice of the reserve price, then you cannot say that, you know, there is no contract because the armor already fell, which means this one already sold. 
the property. So when there is a sale, so when there is a sale which is below the purchase price, then the plaintiff should know before or at the beginning of the auction that there is a reserved price. So not only did the uh, purchaser not know, the defendant wasn't even able to prove that the auctioneer told the purchaser that you know there was a reserved price. And also the um, the the auctioneer here had implied authority to sell to the purchaser. By implied authority, we're talking about commercial transaction, which means when someone has been given authority in agencies, under agency, when someone has been given authority to act on behalf of another person. So where you are given authority to act on behalf of another person, that act will be valid. Do you understand so that it wouldn't be to the detriment of the third party who contracted you know because the third party had noticed that this person was acting on your behalf do you understand so yes here we are done with auction we've spoken about pain and Kane, harris versus nicotine adibaji versus kundi now let us talk about you know another aspect so yes the other aspect we are talking about here is display of goods the first one was auction the second one is display of goods now this one is quite easy for some people i don't know but might not be but it's quite easy now just let me let before i go into like the law basically let, let me give an example imagine you go into a supermarket and you wanted to buy something let's say nutella until i came to my mind because i like you know food and then i like nutella so yes um you 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 picked up a bottle of nutella and then you put it into your basket and then you were walking down um to the cashier's place and then one thing another thing Nutella fell Mom, and broke Brum. and the question is Walade, who is supposed to be liable or what course of action can you bring can you say that there's already a contract there like you have to represent the um, supermarket can you say that there's already a contract there and all that and you're supposed to pay or some, some, something but let us not go into like course of action let us just ask where he picked up the Nutella and put it into his basket, is there already a contract? Do you understand? That's the question we have here. Is there already a contract? That's the whole thing of display of goods. For example, I decided to display a particular thing and then I wrote that the price tag is 5,000 Naira. So now, if me, another person brings 5,000 Naira to me, am I obliged to collect the 5,000 Naira? Do you understand what I'm saying? Or something like that. Do you, do you get so when you're talking about display of goods we are asking what are the laws around when the goods uh, when goods are displayed so now let us go straight to what the law says now according to the law which is common law obviously according to the law here we are talking about sales of goods display of goods when you go to the market to pick up a bottle or to pick up something it could be you're buying pampas or you're buying SMA gold, you already know where I'm going to. All those boys are like, you know, you are buying SMA gold, you are buying this, you are buying that. Now, if you put it in your basket and then you drag your trolley down to the cashier and you want to pay for them, you, the person that wants to pay, is the person that is making the offer. Do you understand? The person who wants to pay is the person making the offer. That is to tell you that when if it is the person who wants to pay that is making the offer, then everything done before that offer is made is invitation to treat. Which means the display of goods in itself is invitation to treat. Do you understand? The fact that you picked it up there is invitation to treat. The fact that you are rolling trolley around, you can continue rolling that trolley and then all of a sudden just remember, ah, oh, I did not bring my wallet, let me go home. When you are working out, they say, ah, Shabi, you've taken it up, then there's a binding contract, you must pay for it or something like that. You understand? So, unless, there are so many people that enter supermarket to have those babe. So, they just don't carry uh, things that they don't even need, put inside trolley, just because they, are, they want to collect numbers. So, when they are passing by the babe, I'm teaching you scope 101 for those things. You don't need to buy anything inside the supermarket. Just pack it lot of things inside the babe. Like, ah, like, like, this boy, this boy, this boy has money or something like that. So just ride your trolley to the uh, babe, you know, something like that and 
you know, get the number. And when they are done, you just go to one place, have a pad, dump it, and then walk out of the supermarket or something like that. So in that question, that, that particular circumstance, when you are walking out of the supermarket, are we not saying that the whole that the whole picking up and putting in the trolley was already a contract? No. According to law, you must get to the cashier. You are the one making the offer to the cashier. Now the cashier will be the one accepting your offer by collecting your money. So and then one other thing you have to know about contracts is that there must be consensus ad idem. Consensus ad idem. Very, very important. Consensus ad idem. It is a legal Latin principle that means meeting of the minds. So before you can say that there is an offer and there is acceptance, which is where consensus at them, at them comes in, it means that okay, okay, let us use the example of you you took you took this thing and then you went to the trolley, you took your trolley, you went to the cashier, and then everything that you carried was about fifteen thousand naira, and the cashier told you it's fifteen thousand naira, and then you give the cashier ten thousand naira. There is no consensus that then, even though the cashier collected the money and was trying to like count the money, so you will not say ah because the cashier has collected the money from you, it means that there is uh, acceptance. No, there is no acceptance because for a contract to be valid and binding, there must be meeting of the minds. So whether or not the cashier actually now collected that money, you know, which could be a lawyerly trick for saying the collecting is acceptance, it is not because the mind has not met. But if she had collected the 15,000 naira and then she had issued you a receipt, that like, oh yes, that is your receipt, then the mind has met. Do you understand? It's actually quite, you know, easy. So that is the principle on that display of goods. So I'll be giving two cases here. The first one is pharmaceutical uh, uh, society of Great Britain versus Booth Cash Chemist. In the case of pharmaceutical society of Great Britain versus Booth's Cash Chemist, the defendant owned a chemist shop organized in accordance with the self-service system. A customer selected a drug with poison in it, which the law required to be sold under the supervision of a chemist. Although the shop had a resident chemist who was authorized to prevent customers from removing dangerous drugs without proper authority, the question arose whether the display of drugs on the shelves was an offer, in which case acceptance took place when a customer put the drug in the shopping basket provided by the defendant's shop. If this was the case, then it would be too late to prevent a customer from removing the drug since the contract to buy and sell would have been concluded by the acceptance. The action was brought as a test case in determining whether there has been an acceptance in the above circumstance. It was held by the Court of Appeal that goods are merely displayed to enable customers to choose what they want and that contract is not completed until the shopkeeper or someone on his behalf accepts the offer after the customer has indicated the articles he needs. In other words, the display on the shelves constitute an invitation to treat. The customer makes the offer by selecting particular goods and the shopkeeper accepts by receiving payment from the customer. In Pharmaceutical Society of Great Britain versus Booth Cash Chemist, which is the fact that we read before, you would see that now, um, let's say there is a and B. I like using A and B because it's very easy. So A here is Pharmaceutical Society of Great Britain. B is the both cash chemist. So now when we are talking, when we, when we are talking about the facts, we are saying that B, according to the law, B is not supposed to sell a particular drug without like a supervision of a chemist. You know there are some drugs that are so poisonous that just a drop of it can kill or at least a tablet can kill as well so you are not supposed to sell those drugs except you are like a doctor or you have a prescription from a doctor do you understand like the, the chemist is not supposed to sell you know those drugs except the person who is buying is a doctor or he has the prescription of a doctor to be supervised by a doctor do you understand so now those kinds of drugs are you know very very important and in this kind of case the drugs that the drug that was sold was poison or something like that now 
the that particular drug was not supposed to be sold except uh, through the supervision of a chemist. So now B had a resident chemist here. So they are the chemist, the resident chemist. However, um, the person who bought the drug had already taken the drug from the shelf. Do you understand? Before was likely arrested or something like that. But the question that was before the court was not whether or not you know the drug was arrested was whether or not taking the drug from the shelf amounted to acceptance of the offer that the shelf itself you know the fact that those drugs are on the shelf was an offer and then you taking it from the shelf amounted to an acceptance and then the court held that that is not an acceptance that is not an offer offer can only be made when you go to meet the cashier and then you tell the cashier you want to buy this thing you give the cashier the money or something like that that is when an offer is made and then acceptance is when you know the the, the the cashier accepts it so that's why the party here is great but the, the, the pharmaceutical society so the pharmaceutical society is suing that chemist because according to them they already sold what the 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 um, terms of the section that criminalizes in court or that says that you selling is a civil wrong or an offense i don't know which one it is but the part of the section says that there should be a sale and a sale is a contract and before there can be a contract you have to have the element of the contract which is offer and acceptance and consideration so according to the pharmaceutical society they are saying that there was a sale here but according to the facts what happened was that there was a taking from the shelf to the trolley so where would you say is that's where they had to mitigate whether or not that the the taking of the drug from the shelf to the trolley was an offer and then the court held that it was not an offer so definitely both cash chemists had not sued the drug at that particular time so let us go to the second case which is the case of lasky versus economy grocery stores lasky versus economy grocery stores so let us read the facts now in the case of Lasky versus Economy Grocery Store, the plaintiff picked a bottle labeled tonic in a self-service grocery store owned by the defendants. While placing it in the career basket provided, it exploded and severely injured her. She brought an action for breach of an implied warranty of merchantability under contract of sales of goods. The action was dismissed by the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court on the ground that there was neither a sale nor an agreement to sell at the time the bottle exploded. In the case of Lasky versus Economy Grocery Store, we are going to see that you know it's almost something similar to this A and B. A versus B. A here is Lasky. Lasky is the one that you know bought the drug which exploded. While B here is the economic grocery store, and so A bought something that exploded. Now the question is, now that it has exploded, was there a contract? Because what the the the, the, the subject matter of the suit was that there was a breach of a warranty of merchantability. Do you understand? So that, that's under you know contract and um, sales of goods. Let us not go to find sales of goods. Let's just talk about contracts. So here we are asking ourselves the question: Was there a contract? There was there offer? Was there acceptance? At this point, I am. I don't even need to go too far to tell you that there was no you know no contract. There was no acceptance, and there was no you know all that happened there was merely invitation to treat. So now we know auction. We know the cases on that auction, Payne and Cave, Aris and Nekasin, Adebaji versus Konde. We know display of goods. We know the cases on that display of goods. We know Pharmaceutical Society of Great Britain versus, um, versus uh, what's the name? Both cash chemists. And also we know Lasky versus Economic Grocery Stores. Now let us go to the last part of our lecture today, which is, you know, buses, trains, and invitation to tender. So yeah, in the final part, which is this, 
uh, we're going to be talking basically on invitation to tender and um, buses, trains, and taxi. Don't forget that you know in the earlier part of this video, I asked the question whether or not advertisements will amount to an offer. With every advertisement, advertisement amount to an offer, I'm going to answer that after answering you know all this. So let us go to the number three: invitation to tender. When you're talking about invitation to tender, let's imagine that you know as a big man that I am, you know. I want to build a house and I want the best of the best so I told people that if you want to help me build my house if you want to help me construct my house drop your like letter of application or something like that and then I'll review it and a lot of people dropped like about 50 people dropped their letter of application and said that they wanted to help me build my house because I'm a billionaire obviously now the question is if those 50 people drop the whole thing would we say that they dropping it is an offer or when i told them to drop i made the offer and then they accepted my offer by dropping do you understand so now in that particular circumstance they dropping their tender that's because mine was an invitation to tender they dropping their tender was an offer me accepting one or two out of the 50 would be acceptance do you understand where the offer or the acceptance is? So now we are talking about buses, trains, and taxi. So when we are talking about bus, trains, and taxis, we are asking ourselves the question, where can we draw the line? Where would we say there is an offer? When I get to the bus stop and I'm about to enter a bus, am I the one making the offer by being at the bus stop and then the bus is accepting my offer by stopping in front of me? Is that where the offer and acceptance is? Or am I the one making the offer when I enter into the bus and then the bus moves? Or was the bus making the offer when the bus stopped and then I accepted it by entering? Now, there are two ways that you would know when there is an offer and there is acceptance. And the question is, when did it become difficult to withdraw from the contract? That is the question. The, 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 the answer to that, two things. Two things, always keep it at the back of your mind when you're answering any question that has to do with offer and acceptance. First of all, when did it become difficult from either party to move out of the contract, to, to, to leave the contract, to say I am no longer interested? When did it become difficult that it is going to be, you know, against the justice of the other party or going to be prejudicial to the other party when one party says I'm no longer interested? Now imagine where the you get to a bus stop and then the bus parks in front. Do you understand? Now, if I say I don't, I don't want to enter that bus again, would it be prejudicial to the other party? Uh, I don't think so. Okay, now imagine, let's say the bus parked, that means the bus was making the offer, and then I entered. If I come down and say I'm no longer interested, would it be prejudicial to the other party? Uh, because I can always come down since the bus has not moved. But when I enter, and then the bus moves. That in itself, it is going to be difficult and prejudicial to the other party when I say I am no longer interested. Now, that is how you get it. When does it become difficult for you to pull out of a contract? When we are talking about the case that has to do with display of goods, when you are displaying your goods and someone says I want to buy, you say you are not selling. It's not, it's not prejudicial to anybody. When you take your trolley, uh, from trolley from the shelf, put it in the trolley, and then you roll it down, it's not prejudicial. When it becomes prejudicial is when you hand over the money to the person and then the person accepts it. Now it becomes difficult. It becomes very difficult for either party to move out of the contract. And that exactly is like a test to knowing whether there is an offer and there is acceptance. Now the second test is whether or not there is consensus added then. When you enter into a bus and then the bus starts moving, at that point there is already consensus added then. You might have meant that you were going this way and the bus is about to take you there. Do you understand? I'm very sure from the beginning you would have known the price. For example, when they are shouting yaba 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 yaba, now when you get to yaba bus, you see them shouting yaba 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 yaba, and they want to take you to yaba. You will obviously have to change him one hundred naira. You already know that it's hundred naira. You already know that. At the time you entered, there has there was no contract at that point. Do you understand that there was no contract? Where the contract came about is where there was implied acceptance. The man did not expressly need to come and meet you and say, "Motin lazi yaba see you contract February." No, what the man just had to do was move. Do you understand? So 
there and there there was a contract and that is where you can find those are the two things to know when it becomes difficult for either party to move out because it's going to be prejudicial to the other party and then was there when did we start or have a consensus added then anything before that point becomes an invitation to treat so lastly we are going to be talking about whether or not all advertisements are uh, offers you are going to be a very worse contract student if you think that every advertisement is an offer i mean advertisement jumps up and down on tv that does not mean that they are making any offer whatsoever now you are not going to find this in any textbook but when an offer when an advertisement becomes an offer when an advertisement becomes an offer is when that advertisement is coupled with a corresponding obligation where for example let me use Khalil and Kabolik there was an advertisement that says buy um Kabolik smoke ball right yes now that advertisement is coupled with a corresponding obligation which says that when you buy it and you fall sick which means you have to fall sick then I am going to pay you hundred dollars do you understand that? Now, any advertisement that, that has a corresponding obligation that the other party must do first, do you understand? Then that advertisement becomes an offer. When the other party fulfills the term of the obligation for the offer, then you have a, a, a binding contract because then there will be acceptance. So when you say, I want to sell my house for five million naira, that is an advertisement. So even if you bring five million naira to me, I only advertised. I never made a, or had a corresponding obligation. Advertisement coupled with the corresponding obligation gives you an offer. A normal advertisement never gives an offer. You must have an advertisement coupled with the corresponding obligation. Do you understand that? Now, uh, also, I just remembered that now that the world is evolving, the next thing that we usually talk about is... Um, Uber, Taxify, Gokada, and the rest, especially when you're living in Lagos with the whole traffic and all that, you might want to take um, Uber, Taxify, and all that. Now, the question we are going to ask in this circumstance is, in when you carry the app and all that, where is the offer made? So let me, let me give you the steps. Now, the first thing you do is to order a ride. Order a ride. And then the next thing they do is to uh, 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 um, acknowledge your ride acknowledge and give you a ride then the bus parks or the car parks in front of you and then you enter and the car drives now if this were not to be if, if this were to be um the normal principle it just you enter is the offer the car drives is the acceptance of the binding contract you ordering a ride they giving you a ride the ride coming to park in front of you you entering and when is the offer now the offer is made when you order your ride it can't be an institution to choose at that point it is an offer because it is clear where you are going to you would have stated it there that i am going to ikorudu or i am going to banana island my dream place in case there's anybody that you know like want to buy me house you can buy that banana island thank you very much so in case you are going to buy, in case you are going to banana island or you are going to ikorodu for some people which is slightly out of lagos or in case you are going to those very you know places then you order a ride and then uber gives you a ride when uber gives you a ride uber accepted your order now you we have already stated the element it's going to take you cost you two five to go there you are going to ikorodu what else do you need for the offer to be precise and clear and anybody who sees the offer accept it and wants to buy you there what else do you need that's why uber made a policy uber made a policy in line with contract law that when they have accepted your offer and then you come out of that particular contract they are going to charge you 400 naira that is a valid charge in court for penalty because like a breach of contract in that particular circumstance where you decide to pull out of the contract so i have taught you a lot and a lot and a lot and you know all i want you to do right now is just to subscribe to this page and like because um 
when you subscribe you are going to get notifications when i release you know other videos and things like that and things like that so please make sure that you subscribe it's very very important also like the video and share the video for other law students we have other law students from other universities please share it thank you very much With another man, you, my adore you.